Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 298. Today is Sunday the 14th of October 2018 and this interview is with Joshua March, Joshua's founder and CEO of Converse Social, a leading social customer service solution used by some of the world's biggest brands. Joshua is an expert in social media and customer service and he just released his book, Message Me, The Future of Customer Service in the Era of Social Messaging and Artificial Intelligence. In this conversation with Joshua, we discuss the state of customer service, examples of customers, companies and industries who are killing it in customer service, what it takes to get customer service right, the role of AI, and much more. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. Joshua March, great to have you on the show. It's been many years in the making in that we've known each other sort of off and on a distance, walking around in similar circles. And, um, and congratulations on your new book. So in your own words, tell us who you are, Joshua. Thank you, and, uh, and great to be on as well. I, I, so I'm Joshua March. I'm the founder and CEO of, of Converse Social, um, and also the author of Message Me, which we'll, we'll chat about. Uh, I've been in the social media space for a very long time. Uh, so going back, actually over 10 years ago, uh, I founded a company called iPlatform that was one of the first ever Facebook app development agencies. So we're building Facebook apps for big brands, just as the kind of Facebook platform was, was first emerging. Uh, which was a, a very exciting time. You may remember it was kind of people throwing sheep at each other, um, poking each other, and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but while it was great and built a successful agency that was building these kind of apps for all these brands, it was pretty clear to me that Facebook apps were a bit of a fad. Um, and I knew that they were kind of, you know, it was a very exciting time, but I knew they weren't going to be around you know, years on. But I, I did believe that there was some really uh, important changes happening in just the core of how people interacted with each other and with businesses. Um, you know, the iPhone was just launching, uh, every, and I was kind of, every, social was just kind of moving into to mobile. And, and I really believed that all communication was going to shift into smartphones, into social media, into all these new channels, um, which certainly, yeah, fast forward to now it has. Um, and... So that kind of sparked the initial vision for Conver Social, which was, you know, as all these, all, all, as all the communication patterns shift, uh, businesses are going to need new tools to help them man- manage the communication with their customers through these channels. So that was the kind of core founding vision. Um, and then as we kind of got out there and started experimenting and building different tools and seeing what was out there, uh, we got increasingly excited about the customer service use case. You know, there were a lot of companies in the kind of early days of social uh, figuring out how to help marketing teams uh, do better at social. Um, but you know, again, back in kind of 2011, there was some a small number of companies, including uh, Tesco, who was one of the first companies to do this, who we started working with, who were moving social into their contact center and who were trying to figure out how they could have real teams of customer service agents um, you know, responding and resolving real service issues through through social media and uh, as I got to learn more about this I, I found it a really compelling and exciting opportunity you know, I believe that as these channels became the main way that people interacted they would naturally become some of the biggest customer service channels and every company would have to move social into their contact center um, and so we kind of pivoted the business a little bit to really focus 100% on you know, bridging that gap between uh, in the rapidly shifting world of social and now messaging on the one hand and, and the needs of the large enterprise contact center on the other hand. Um, so kind of went about you know, doing that for a number of years quite successfully. Um, and, and now over the last couple of years, that kind of industry has shifted again with the kind of rapid trajectory and rise of, of messaging, which I can chat about, uh, and also the development of automation and bots, which is I think is going to be creating a lot of changes in customer service. And, and that's really why I kind of wrote the book as well. You know, I saw that the industry was shifting quite a lot um, with messaging, with AI, and I wanted to kind of you know, lay out my vision for how, how the industry was going to change and, and what companies needed to do about it. 
it's um, a bold thing to do to write a, a book in these fast changing times, right? Um, yes. So Converse Social was born in, in the UK. That's when I first came across you, as I understand it. And then you moved to the States. The question I have for you is, do you see brand marketing, customer service being done differently from the UK versus the US? Or, or how would you spin or see segment how companies are doing differently, these branding, marketing and customer service? Yeah. Um, so yes, they are and, and in relatively subtle ways. You know, I'd say that from a marketing perspective, uh, companies in America went all in on social, you know, in, in a more aggressive way than companies in the UK did. The UK have kind of caught up and they've always been there, but, but the US really went very heavily into kind of making social a core part of, of digital marketing strategy pretty early. Um, interestingly, it kind of started the other way from a customer care perspective, um, which, which was the UK companies kind of realized that they could use these channels. Maybe it's the kind of British tendency to apologize and say sorry, uh, that they, these channels were like very you know, important places to, to deliver customer service. And so actually, the UK was kind of ahead of the US in uh, you're investing into customer service teams responding on social media. Um, now, within that, there are also just differences in within different verticals. So, for example, uh, retailers in the UK um, were much more invested into kind of digital transformations much earlier than retailers in the US. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for that. Yeah. Well, we we always say that Britain's the uh, shop of house, the the nation of housekeeper uh, shopkeepers. Nation of shopkeepers, indeed. And you know, the UK has always actually been ahead of the US on e-commerce. Yeah. You know, greater percentage of, of people shop using e-commerce in the UK, and so because of that, I think that the UK retailers were kind of just ahead of the game. Um, so you know, when I first came to the US five six years ago, retailers didn't really care about what we were doing, um, but in the last few years. All of the big retailers in the U.S. have started to really invest into digital transformations um, and figuring out how they can you know, really. I think a lot of them are very excited. A lot of ones we're we're working with are very excited about how they can really use you know, social messaging as a way of transforming their customer service operations. Um, so, so that's super exciting. Uh, and, and yeah, but there are just a lot of these changes between them, mm. and so it's kind of it's kind of not necessarily obvious differences. Yeah. But ones and once you really get into the details, you start to see how they, they operate differently. That's the interest of the question. That's cool. You you mentioned the sorry fact. I was reading in in one or other British paper this morning how um, the British Rail has written the word sorry in social according to this some enormous number of times <clears throat> um, because of all the lateness and retired. Anyway, they, it was interesting that they're measuring it in social in the UK. Yeah, no, they, we actually, um, uh, almost every single train company in the UK uses Combo Social. Uh, right. So we, we have a pretty good, good awareness. You have a good beat on that one. All right, so yeah. since really the, the topic is around customer service, which is where you have you know, plunged yourself into and it's the, the nature of what you're doing in Message Me, it's it's a topic that I find extremely interesting because it's basically the only department in the company that has the word customer in it. So everyone's talking about customer centricity, and yet so many companies are outsourcing customer service. So it's like the thing that you're wanting to make as a center is being put outside of your company. How on earth does that go? So for me, as you are seeing all these companies working on customer service how how do you gauge the level of interest on this topic and and do you see there between the difference between what i say i do and what i do i do yeah it's uh it's interesting right you, you're completely right that a lot of companies uh do that it, it's it's a it's a real problem you know we have seen it's been interesting over the last 10 years because you know a lot of companies i think got excited about the kind of zappos model of customer service you know, you know, where they've got these highly trained agents um, picking up the phone instantly and you know, doing whatever it takes to make you happy. Staying on and, as long as they need to. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of brands got kind of excited about that and actually did start to fig you know, try and figure out how they could like insource more agents, um, you know, invest more into agent training and agent quality and agent happiness. 
Um, but then unfortunately, the same brands kind of realized that that was super expensive and then just made it increasingly hard to actually speak to those agents, right? <laughs> Hi, taking the phone number off the website, uh, you know, we get to kind of really search for you know, details to get it. You know, when you actually get on, when you get do get onto the phone, you have to go through like complex, you know, IVR menus that are really designed to get you to fall off. Uh, one, when you finally get through the IVR, IVR menu, they're, they're like waiting on hold for 30 minutes, and then you get through to an agent who's like, you know, <laughs> has a high EQ, and it's kind of like it's too late by then, right? It, it's really the so exact. Pissed. It, it's actually the kind of opposite approach uh, than what businesses should be doing. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, the book Effortless Experience, uh, which is by CB, then now part of Gartner. Um, and you know, they did just like decades of research on what actually makes a difference to customer loyalty when someone has a problem. And the core of their, of their findings is that when someone has a problem, they just want it to be solved as quickly and easily as possible. And you know, if, if you really go above and beyond you know, first contact resolution, you know, amazing, like kind of incredible moments of wow, whatever you do, you can make a slight positive difference to, to loyalty at the end of the day, but it's only slight. But if you put anything in the way, any kind of hassle factor, you know, having to repeat themselves, having to like, you know, being shuffled between different agents, having, being asked to switch channels, you know, all the kind of stuff that seems to happen in every customer service interaction, uh, all of that stuff has a ma massive negative impact on customer loyalty. And actually, potential negative impact was like four times, four times bigger than the potential positive impact of going above and beyond. And so really that approach is backwards, right? Instead of making it difficult to get to an agent and then having an incredible agent at the end of it, actually what you want to do is just make it as fast and simple and easy to get an answer. Um, and that's actually what, one of the reasons why we think messaging is, is so powerful and, and what, what makes automation compelling within it. Um, but but it, so in terms of how we look at does a company care about it, you know, we have seen an increasing trend of chief customer officers, mm -hmm. um, you know, more and more brands have these these kind of you know, executives sitting in the C-suite who are really, you know, their job is to like look at the entire customer journey, you know, across you know from from marketing to sales to customer care and kind of map that out and look at where they're falling short. And so, yeah, it's, re it's still a relatively small number, but increasing. And when we see a company who has a chief customer officer, it's usually a really good indication that, that they do care. Um, we also look a lot at, you know, what does the CEO do? You know, if there's a CEO who's like on Twitter, who's listening to customer issues, who's like responding back, you know, that, that tends to be a super strong signal that, you know, as an organization, they're going to really care about that, their customers. I'm thinking of Ronan Dunn in particular. Is that someone you're yeah. thinking about? Yeah, yeah, Ronan Dunn at Verizon. Uh, and he was at, uh, I think, O2 before. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you've got uh, John Leger from T-Mobile uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, and there are a number of others who are, who are kind of like that, you know, who are really listening if you pay attention, if you, if you want to message them. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting is to look at where <clears throat> the, the, where the what industries are more attuned with the idea of customer service. And if you look at the telecoms, basically that's – essentially a negative space it's mostly about negative things i don't have coverage my, my bills over i got you know suckered into whatever charges and so and like hospitals you you go to hospitals and it's only problems so there's certain industries where it's all about managing the negatives and then there are other industries like hotels which are supposed to be positive experiences where you're going to go to get pampered and it's a lovely experience and and of course, there are negative things that happen, but it's more about trying to expand the positives. So you just mentioned those two, T-Mobile and Verizon. Do you see other industries where customer service is, is being well handled and the CEO, for example, is really on board? Yeah, I mean, so as you said, telcos, a massive part, probably one of the biggest parts of their cost base is customer care, right? So, and, and most of it's still over the phone, so anything they can do to reduce uh, complaints and shift people more into digital just makes a massive impact on the bottom line. Um, but you know, airlines are another one, especially when we go in you know, the social and messaging world. You know, have been very, very prominent. Um, you, you know, social media uh, just has caused so many issues for them 
right? That uh, you know, starting back from kind of five years ago, uh, there was an issue when someone was unhappy that BA hadn't responded to them for a couple of days after they lost his father's bags, and they spent a thousand dollars promoting tweets about talking about how bad BA was. Right. That kind of you know, made everyone made everyone in the airline industry really stand up. Certainly made BA stand up. Mm-hmm. You know, they're now investing super heavily into like ensuring they can deliver an incredible experience. Uh, you know, over social as a result, right. and but that's the same as most airlines. You know, most of them got caught kind of flat-footed um, because I think you know, a lot of a lot of travelers, especially business travelers, you know, they're on the go, they're on their phones, they're likely to be on Twitter, you know, more likely to be influential. You know, when they have a problem, it's kind of easier for it to go viral and blow up. So you know, airlines just suffer from kind of viral issues on, on social all the time. Now, as a result, they've actually invested into it much more seriously than, than many other industries. And for a majority of airlines now, you can just message them privately with any issue you have and you, know, you get a response within minutes and they resolve your issue and it's a really incredible experience. Um, so it's very kind of positive that's come out of that. So when you when you sell in Converse Social to a company, yeah. you mentioned before the transformation that messaging has in customer service. I typically look at the transformations that digital makes for entire organizations. But I'd be interested to see or hear from you how, when you get Converse Social working well within the company, what kind of transformations need to happen inside, organizationally, process-wise, or whatever, in order for the customer service then to work well on your platform? Sure. Yeah, because you know, obviously our platform is, a, is a, a part of it, but it's really just an enabler. Right? It's an enabler of doing these things at scale and, and super efficiently. Uh, the key thing is, you know, first of all, if you really want to shift a large percentage of your service volume into messaging, um, and the reason for doing that is because we're seeing higher customer experience scores because it's so easy and convenient for customers and lower cost to serve because it's much more efficient to manage and easier to deliver in automation. Um, so if you want to do that, you know, you've got to figure out, okay, well, if we, put, if we put a message us button on our website or we use the messenger chat widget, which is like a replacement for web chat powered by messenger, um, you know, businesses have to be able to see the impact of that because the consumer demand is pretty huge. You know, consumers will go to those in very large numbers once you show them that you can do it. And that's great if you have all of the success metrics and a plan for refiguring our resourcing. So generally the first step is to say, okay, we need to like test it. You know, let's, let's A, B test. Let's, put the, let's show the message us buttons with a certain percentage of our customers and let's measure how many customers use that instead of emailing, instead of chatting, instead of phoning. You know, let's really measure that deflection rate on that, on that subset of customers. Let's understand the resourcing requirements and make sure we're measuring, you know, doing surveys to customers in the same way as other channels. We're measuring average handling time for cases and resolution rate for cases. Um, and really test it and get that data so that you can say, yep, we know that if we show 100% of our customers this button, 25% of them are going to come to messaging. That's going to cause a drop you know, accordingly in these other channels. That means that we're going to have to shift you know, 100 agents from these other digital channels into messaging. Mm-hmm. So let's make sure we give them the appropriate training, that you know, the finance team understand that that's what's happening, that you know, no one's going to get scared about that because there's suddenly so many messages coming in. You really need to kind of set it up and, and have a proper program for doing that. Um, now, behind the scenes, obviously, you know, Converse Social helps enable that team. You also, will pr- depending on the use case or the use cases, may want to integrate it into various CRM system or other systems you have, build authentication flows. But those things, you know, obviously, while important, that's what, what we build, they're all really the enablers of, of the overall program, mm-hmm. which is how do we move more of our customer care volume into messaging and have an impact on you know, overall customer satisfaction and, and the overall cost of, of customer care. All right, so that sounds great. So I, I really like that idea of dimensioning the, the, the amount of help you need or you know, resources according to an A-B test that allows you to sort of evaluate things. And then the metrics and how do how do message does messaging per se because you, you and I were talking before about the most controversial element of your book is that you're really encouraging companies to go to messaging chats as opposed to these chat um, 
spaces where you have this sort of time you have to be on it and and see it or emails um how, how does how does it change the metrics are are cuz i mean at some level are the metrics what are, what are the, maybe put another way what are the best metrics to use to evaluate success in your in your mind as opposed sure. to zappos mind <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, for most companies the majority of service volume they have is still over the phone and you know, the key goal of a lot of customer service organizations is to figure out how to reduce that because for the most part, digital channels are better for the customers, you know, better experiences and cheaper for the business, right? But, but most digital channels today just haven't been able to do that very well. They've done it to, to, to an extent, but not to a large part. Um, and so when you think about the metrics for customer care over, over messaging, our position is that you really need to figure out how to manage it and measure it in the same way as you can measure phone calls, because that's the bulk of your service interactions today, and that's the most comparable. You, know, you, you need you need to know how it compares. You need to be able to measure customer experience versus the phone. You need to be able to measure cost versus the phone. Um, and a lot of people in the kind of social and the messaging world, you know, kind of looked at social. It doesn't fit necessarily neatly into traditional case management systems doesn't exactly match how emails work or how chats work and so they've just kind of gone well we'll we'll treat it separately we'll give it its own metrics we'll look at engagement scores or number of messages and you know that just doesn't really work you you can do it but then if you're sitting if if you're the head of a contact center trying to figure out where you invest your resources if it's a load of metrics which give you no direct comparison it's impossible to make that investment case Mm. Um, so, so we think it's really important that you kind of match into the rest of the contact center. Um, but how you do that is actually quite difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because you know, again, if you take like a traditional web chat, web chat starts, <clears throat> starts, it ends pretty easy to see how long it lasted. You know, did the issue get resolved at the end of it? You know, how long did the agent spend on it, etc. Um, with messaging, you have this continuous conversation. Infinite. The, the, the infinite never truly begins or ends. You know, a conversation may span minutes, may span days, may span weeks, right? And so you actually have to you know, impose or superimpose a, a case management system on top of it in order to get a firm idea of, you know, when, when, when is a case object that's similar to a phone call or a chat that has a start, has an end, has a survey that follows up, you know, allows you to manage all those average handling time and think resolution rates. So we do a lot of design work on kind of thinking about how to how to manage that, how to have a case management system that really works with messaging in the best way. Uh, it turns out to actually be pretty complex uh, because of the way the intricacies of when people can follow up and when they can't. You know, if an agent thinks something is closed, but then the customer doesn't think it's closed, you know, how do you manage that interaction? Um, and it's a careful balance because yeah, uh, ideally you want as fixed a data object as possible to make it more as you know, as comparable as possible to a phone call. Um, but you also have to have a certain degree of flexibility. But you just can't have it too flexible. So yeah, it's fascinating because I really hadn't thought about it. But the infinite level and the lack mm. of closure, which you you could probably have also with an email. But there's a sort of a way with an email as you can construct. Well, are you satisfied? Then we're going to close it. And, yeah. and there's sort of a permission that seems to allow closure quicker. Whereas in yeah. chat, it's more like a relationship. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's continuous conversation that, that, that never ends. And maybe it intermixes and combines care issues, sales issues, marketing conversations. You know, it's kind of everything. It's the same way as your, you know, your WhatsApp conversation with, with a friend, right? And the, and the spans other, multiple topics. Yeah, and the other thing about the the messenger approach, of course, is that you can have multiple conversations happening at the same time, like we do on WhatsApp or or Messenger. When you're on, you know, you, you start chatting with a bunch of people, and maybe for some of us that's easier enough to do as friends. But when you're in a in a customer service center situation, you've got to get back into the space of that person because if you waft out and you just treat it glibly where actually that was getting serious and vice versa, you could end up really going down the wrong path. So, I mean, the training style has to be different too. Yeah, indeed. The training, the agent workflow, the general process for how they manage uh, your interactions all ends up being subtly different. 
All right, so um, you also write, so message me, the subtitle is The Future of Customer Service in the Era of Social Messaging and Artificial Intelligence. So I'd like to know uh, what is your perspective on the role of artificial intelligence in customer service, presumably within Conversocial? Yeah, so you know, as I'm sure you're aware, there have just been a huge developments from an AI perspective over the last few years, yeah, mainly actually around the hardware that has just made it uh, far cheaper uh, and faster and easier than ever before to use you know, things like deep learning algorithms uh, over large data sets. It used to be very expensive and slow. Now it's pretty you know, fast and easy and cheap. And that's kind of opening up a lot of new opportunities to start to really implement machine learning into business processes, including customer service. Um, at, at the same time, I think there's a really unique opportunity afforded by messaging. Um, <clears throat> and let, let me explain that a little bit more. So in the live chat world, right, where you have a conversation happening in real time, it can be quite hard to have a bot because you put a bot there and the bot has to be able to handle a large amount of you know, a very flexible, large amount of questions. Um, otherwise, pretty quickly, it won't understand. And it will have to then say, sorry, I don't understand you, which is kind of annoying if you're a customer. And then it'll probably have to hand off to a human. And it may take a few minutes to hand off to a human. Meantime, you're like sitting there waiting. So it's a pretty painful, pretty frustrating experience. And you know, the truth is, there just isn't any bot today that can really handle a completely open-ended service conversation. So, so, so that's essentially the result of every interaction with a, with a chatbot, right? But uh, because of the asynchronous nature of, of messaging, you know, it's more like texting a friend, that means that even if there's a 10 to 15 minute delay between messages, that's still a pretty much real-time conversation. You know, the person, you're not sitting there waiting for a response. You send a message, put it in your phone, Message comes in again, pull it out, respond back. Uh, and that means that you're able to combine automation and humans into the same conversation in a very seamless way. Because you know, the bot can handle simple stuff. And if there's anything that comes in that it doesn't understand or is more complex, rather than having to say, I don't understand, I'm going to hand you to a human, you know, sit there and wait, you know, that can just happen in the background. And the, and the response can come back from a human who... Maybe they've reviewed an automated answer and approved it. Maybe they've just taken over the conversation fully. You know, and you know, once the com more complex stuff's been dealt with, they can hand back to the automated system that can handle follow-up and anything else. And that's just completely seamless from a, from a user experience. Um, and that, that, the ability to combine automation and humans in that way means that you know, if you deploy automation and that automation can only handle... 20% or 30% of issues or, or messages, then all that happens is that you know, it makes a really 30% improvement to resolution time for customers, 30% improvement to efficiency for the agents, but there's never a situation where it's saying it doesn't understand or creating frustration for the customer. Mm. So it's kind of only, it's only positive. And then you can gradually add more and more automation over time, whether that's a bot at the front end handling more simple stuff, whether that's just automation behind the scenes, you know, helping improve more and more of what the agent's doing from an efficiency perspective, you know, all the kind of back end processes they have to follow. Uh, and so I think that that's really exciting. Uh, and that's certainly our approach at Common Social as well, and there are other people doing it. But you know, when, when you look at generally the approach to AI, there's a lot of, a lot of people in the customer service world investing into AI but just in a very general way for customer care. Uh, and no one's really linking it in the way that we are in terms of, you know, there are unique ways if you combine automation and messaging that actually are better than any other service channel. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that's what I'm kind of excited about. That's it. Um, so give, a, give us an idea. So when Conversational is being sold into a company, be bought by a company, do they buy packages that includes AI or how, do, how does the AI get billed at that point? Sure. Um, yeah. So right now, you know, yeah, there generally is some additional packages. You know, we have we have a couple of uh, two different main areas uh, around automation. One is our Navigator product. Uh, Navigator is a bot that sits at the front end of a messaging conversation that automates the first couple of interactions. 
finds out what kind of problem people have, um, collects basic information that's needed. Once it has that information, hands it over to a human agent to resolve it. Pretty simple. Um, yeah, we, we do charge a small amount for that on, on, on top. Um, and then we're also looking at how we can automate more and more stuff behind the scenes with what we call agent assistance, where we have you know, intelligent prioritization, for example, that learns from what the agents are doing and what they're responding to, brings that to the top. Uh, we're going to be releasing intelligent tagging soon, again, based on machine learning, helping the agents categorize the issues that are coming in according to their own their own you know, schema of customer service tags. Um, and we're gradually rolling out more and more of that. Um, you know, right now, our core pricing is still based on the number of agents, but we think that as automation tech starts to take a bigger and lo- you know, a larger and larger volume of issues, then potentially we'll look at shifting to more of a kind of yeah, volume-based model based on the number of customers being served. Um, but, you know, we're still in, in the midst of that transition and the majority is certainly still agent-based today. That's for sure. And the last question I want to have is, is um, I'm just about to release a book on um, basically artificial empathy. I was wondering to what extent your with your machines and, and your position, you're looking at the insertion of empathy into the AI, into customer service, and where what's the state of empathy over in New York? Yeah, <laughs> that's a wider question potentially. Um, yes, it is. Yeah, the way that so we're, we're approaching this from kind of two 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 sides, right? Like I said, so on the navigator side, it's more about simple bot interactions, just at the beginning of the conversation, automating very easy, straightforward stuff. As soon as someone gets upset has a more complex issue, taking it to a human agent, but who is then being supported by uh, by machine learning and AI. Uh, some of that may just be around the edges, right? So still leaving the humans to actually handle the responses. But at some point, we're likely to add in like suggested responses, potentially even automated responses that have been trained on what the agents have done. So it looks at responses the agents have made in the past and then suggests similar responses. Um, and so the key there is that it's obviously being trained on a data set uh, of real human responses. And obviously, if the humans tend to show empathy in those situations, that will train the machine learning models to show empathy in those situations mm-hmm. as well. Uh, so I think in those situations, it really comes down to you know, the, training, the training set and how, and how the system is being trained. Fascinating. And, so, yeah, it's, that's be key. It's, so it's not about encoding empathy. It's just about learning about the other's empathy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. At least, at least now we're we're implementing it. That's brilliant. Well, hey, Josh, that was lovely. Thanks for coming on the show. I know you're a busy man and uh, always on the move. It's good to be able to connect and, and have a little bit of quality time. Tell us how people can find out more about you, track you down, buy your book, of course. Yeah, message indeed. me uh, and and otherwise get in touch with Conversocial. Sure. I mean, the easiest way to interact with me is to you know, follow me on Twitter or message me on Twitter. Uh, I'm just at Joshua March. Uh, and the RCH, uh, and you know, that has kind of links to everything else. Obviously, you can search for message me on Amazon, and you know, check out Conversocial on conversocial.com or search for us. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love to connect with you. So please, please do message me. Well, it's been a pleasure messaging and um, being in real time too. Hey, thanks a lot, Josh. Joshua. Yeah. Thanks, Minter. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please like the handy Facebook button. Or better yet, head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. But first, relax to Josh Sachs's finger paint. Oh, fill me with all your colors any different way To rid me of the gray And heal me with all your imperfections you mention in your lack of self-security Oh, I wouldn't care about the art form As long as you would feel warm Wrapped in canvas, hold me tightly Slowly we would paint a lover's portrait With all your favorite shades 
Edges in our palms make colors blend and look ugly in the end. But they're pretty in their own disgusting values. We'd hang our portraits in.